Is your houseplant care rooted in science? Let's hope so. We find out more with guest Ashley Essekin this week, delving deep into the world of soil science. Thanks for all your fabulous feedback on the new email newsletter on the UK houseplant scene, The Plant Ledger, which came out last Friday. The next one will be out next Friday. That's March the 25th, 2022. So plenty of time to subscribe for that. And you get my free in-depth guide to tackling fungus gnats if you subscribe. So check out the show notes for details of how to sign up for The Plant Ledger. And if you're a small planty business and you fancy advertising in the plant leisure, also drop me a line and I can fill you in on the details. There are special reduced rates for the first three editions. While I'm saying thanks, I'd like to extend a warm thank you to Ange, who upgraded from legend to superfan status. Ange, your special exclusive superfan status card should be winging its way to you now, the postal service notwithstanding. Do you really know what's going on around the roots of your houseplants? This week's episode is really going to make you think because I'm joined by soil scientist Ashley Essekin, from Gardening in Canada, and she has so much good advice for us houseplant growers about how the substrate around our roots works and how it's affecting the growth of our plants. This interview was so rich, interesting and lengthy that I've decided to split it between two episodes. So in today's show, you'll be hearing part one and next week we'll get on to part two. I know I always say this, but this is really true for this episode. Please do go and look at the show notes where you'll find detailed notes that go into the subjects that Ashley discusses in more depth and links to her YouTube channel and articles about certain topics that she covers. So do check those out. It will really help your understanding of the topic because it's quite a lot of science in here, which is fantastic. So without any further ado, let's welcome Ashley to the show and find out where we're all going wrong with our potting mixes. My name is Ashley Asikin, and I'm a graduate for the University of Saskatchewan. Um, I specifically graduated from the College of Agriculture and Bioresources with a major in soil science and a minor in plant science. And since then, I've spent 10 years in the industry on an agricultural side, helping with food production. But I've also been an avid houseplant owner since I was about 15 years old. So my bedroom as a teenager Instead of posters of, um, you know, spice girls and whatever else, it was literally wall to wall terrariums, uh, aquariums and plants. So it was an absolute mess of a room, drove my parents insane, but (laughs) it thrived and it did very, very well because I used so much of the science that I learned from university and I applied it to my plants. So fast forward into COVID when everyone started getting into plants. Um, or gardening in general, we ended up, I ended up with so many questions to the point that several of my friends said, you need to make a resource bank that people can go to and just watch your stuff or read your stuff. So you don't have to keep on repeating everything over and over again. So out of pure convenience, because of friends and family, I made a YouTube channel and a website. And I guess I picked up a couple other subscribers along the way, but it's all in good fun. I really do enjoy it. Oh, well, your resource of information is most excellent, I have to say. And I will obviously put in the show notes your YouTube channel and website because it's enormously useful because there's a lot of misconceptions out there, aren't there? What are the major misconceptions that you face as an educator when you're talking to houseplant growers about soil science? Yeah, so I have four that are kind of like my biggest pet peeves, sterile soil, organic fertilizers, semi-hydro just in general, and then humidity actually are my four biggest ones, categories that I get a lot of misconceptions drawn from. 
the one that really out of those four that really strikes me is the idea of making everything sterile. What should we be worried about finding in our houseplant soil? Yeah. So when it comes to um, sterile soil, I advocate absolutely do not sterilize it. The main reason for that is because if you're having issues just in general with um, pests or disease, it's probably because you actually have a microbe imbalance. And so as soil scientists, we understand this very heavily in an outdoor environment. And it's starting to move into the horticulture realm as well. But what it comes down to is the fact that when you have too many bad bugs and not enough good bugs, that's an imbalance. And so we end up with presence of disease and pests because when we have the good bugs present, they will generally outcompete for resources, both in the soil and on the surface of the plant, or they will actually eat each other. So the beneficials will eat the uh, non-beneficials. And I'm not sure what the case is for your viewers across the world, but here in Canada, and I know in the US as well, uh, beneficial bugs are present, you can purchase them. So anything you can get for the soil, whether it be nematodes or mites, always try to encourage that growth because that's going to help suppress things like mealybugs, strips, fungus gnats, stuff of that nature. And then the other reason why I always say do not sterilize is because a huge component of your actual nutrients that your plant uptakes has to go through some sort of microbe um, reorganization, I guess, for lack of a better term. So when we have even just the nitrogen cycle, we have nitrifying and denitrifying bacteria. And if we're using organic fertilizers, we really do need those bacteria there. Even if we're using conventional fertilizers, we also need them there, particularly if we're using a slow release or a granular option, things of that nature. So again, when it comes to nutrient cycling in general, you need those microbes present. And without them, your plant's not going to get the nutrients it needs. So do not go for sterile soil. Aim always for the dirtiest soil on the planet. That's always my motto. Well, that's good to hear. Um, yeah, beneficial insects are big here as well. But it, there's also what I call the sort of the hydrogen peroxide brigade that love to just get that hydrogen peroxide onto the soil um, and are panicking about fungus gnats and think that's a great solution. I'm assuming that's pretty much going to be killing everything else in the soil. Yeah. So um, whenever people will always ask, well, if I apply this, it won't harm the beneficial microbes, right? Like the beneficials will be okay. And a good rule of thumb is, is if it's harming bacteria and that's the aim or the goal of the product you're applying, then it's harming all bacteria. It's not genetically modified. And when we're talking about like glyphosates and stuff, that is a genetically modified plant with a chemical being applied so that that plant isn't affected by that chemical. But when it comes to generic things like vinegar or hydrogen peroxide, like, yeah, you're nuking everything in the system. And something to note, actually, when it comes to hydrogen peroxide is that the shelf-stable stuff you get from your pharmacy or just at the store that you purchase generally will be non-food safe and it will contain silver. And silver is the product that they put in it to try to neutralize um, or make it more shelf-stable. Um, and silver is actually really toxic to plants. So you may not kill your plant by adding hydrogen peroxide, you know, month after month after month, but you will reduce growth because you're basically constantly introducing a toxin, which will harbor just natural metabolical processes that happen in the plant. So if you are wanting to use hydrogen peroxide, which I would never advocate for, you want to get actual food grade hydrogen peroxide. It's not nearly as shelf stable, so it's going to cut into your plant budget even more. And it's not going to have the silver, so you're not going to have the toxic effect of the silver being introduced into your soil. Ooh, that's interesting. That is interesting to hear. I had no idea about that, but that's really good to know. And I mean, I guess this is the thing. People kind of think that because it's in their kitchen cupboard, 
similarly with things like vinegar, that it's natural and safe and okay. And actually, obviously, that it in a way, it hasn't gone through all the many tests and hurdles that commercial products have to go through in order to be approved for use for these particular uses. So in a way, they're kind of more dangerous, these home remedies. It seems to me a lot of them end up being uh, more of a risky option. Oh, yeah, I totally agree. The other one that um, people will use is like the Dawn dish soap pack. Mm. And that one is like horticulturalists know this, plant scientists know this, soil scientists know this, is that any sort of liquid dish soap is actually a detergent. It's not a soap. So what it does is it strips the cuticle of your plant. And so when it strips the cuticle of your plant, you end up, yes, killing off, you know, your spider mites if that's the issue you're having at the time, but it also can leave a site open for bugs to attach to and attack the plant even harder because now it has a site that's even more lush and green and easier to contact um, and eat and suck from. So yeah, that's another one. Let's have a quick chat about, I'm um, just going through your list of your misconceptions here, semi-hydro. I mean, we could have a whole episode on this, but what is it with semi-hydro that people sort of get wrong? Because it's harder than it looks possibly. Yeah. So I do both actually, which may sound funny as a soil scientist. I do full hydro, semi-hydro, and then obviously soil. Um, and I think the biggest misconception when it comes to using LECA or Latrusa Pond is the fertilizer side of things. So people will simply just throw fertilizer in um, to their reservoirs or into their uh, semi-hydro. So that would just essentially be the cup. Or I find that they'll go to like a hydro place and they'll get the hydro fertilizers and then they'll amend with those. But the reality is, is that plants, regardless if, if they're in soil or out of soil, have a very specific pH in which they absorb nutrients. And that range is actually pretty small. And so whenever you're doing semi-hydro and you're just dumping fertilizer in, you're not helping your plant whatsoever because I can almost guarantee that your water is going to not be the pH it needs to be at. So actually adjusting that pH is huge um, to see good results. So I did like an experiment on my own with this. I did it with a Munster Pinaparata and I had two, uh, both of them grown in LECA, same volumes of water, same vessels um, and same place actually in my house. One, I just used regular tap water and I dumped in willy nilly, whatever fertilizer. The other one, I actually adjusted my pH on. So here where I am in Canada, it comes out to about an eight, a pH of eight once I throw my fertilizers in. And so that's way too high. So I actually adjusted that and uh, the, the results are drastic. <laughs> It is honestly crazy to watch uh, the difference between the two. So whenever possible, always aim for synthetic fertilizer, not an organic fertilizers. Organic fertilizers do not respond well in a semi-hydro system. Um, aim for synthetic and always adjust the pH before you apply it to your containers. And is there any point in testing the pH of your soil when, you, when you're doing soil-based growing? I mean, it is... It, or is it likely that whatever substrate you're using, if it's a conventional soil mix, will be just about okay? No, actually, yeah, you, you'd want to check that as well. Um, so I've experimented again with this on my own. And uh, whether you're using peat or coconut coir, it tends to be on the more acidic side. And then I find as people start throwing in compost or vermicompost, uh, anything like that, it ends up actually lowering the pH even further. And then as the soil ages, um, the potting soil ages, I find it gets more and more acidic, which is normal because what happens is uh, pH is a measure of basically free floating hydrogen ions. And as uh, our composts are 
coconut coir and our peat moss get decomposed by the microbes, they're basically plucking off hydrogens from the compounds. And then those hydrogens are just kind of floating in the system, which obviously changes the pH. So my buffer now to counter that is actually using lime, or you could use gypsum, depending on what your test comes back at, and uh, adjust it accordingly. So it's so funny. This issue has plagued me for so many years. I've been so frustrated by it that I'm actually developing a sensor that accurately tests pH for people and tells them on an app basically what they need to do. Yeah, with their potting soil, because it just drives me so crazy. Um, and you will have heavily restricted growth if that pH is not on the mark. So definitely, definitely important. So is it worth investing in a, a pH tester? And Because you can buy quite cheap ones, but I always think possibly with this kind of thing, it's better investing in something that's going to last you. In an ideal world, you'd want to get um, something of a little bit more substance. Um, if you are buying it for less than $50 uh, Canadian, I don't know what that would be in Euro, but or pounds, whatever you guys are using there. Um, but you, you want, if it's under $50 or even sometimes under 70 bucks, it's probably not an ideal uh, pH tester. You'd want to get something of substance. And keep in mind that can be, used and reused um, across all your pots. I mean, these things don't just like break in a year. This would be over the lifetime of your uh, plant hobby. Uh, it can be used in the garden, that sort of thing. And yeah, if you check your pH every time after you water, it's going to give you a good idea of where everything's at. And then you can amend it accordingly, uh, again, with like the gypsum or the lime. Uh, in some cases, it may involve repotting if it's really off. But if you're looking for really rapid growth, absolutely get something to test your pH with. Well, I've just done a quick Google and I can tell you that 50 Canadian is about 29 British pounds and about 35 euros as we speak. So there you go, if anyone wants a translation. Although I often find actually that when you actually go to buy the product, oftentimes it's the same in dollars as it is in pounds, just because things cost a bit more here. So who knows? But I, I think, yeah, as you say, if you invest in something um, that is decent, then it will probably last you a lot longer. Well, that's really interesting. How do you know how much lime or gypsum to add? I mean, uh, is it just a question of feeling your way? And adding a small amount and then retesting and checking that you're not going too far. A general rule of thumb is that if you have a specific brand of potting soil mix that you enjoy and use for pretty much an entire year, that product will sit around the same pH in and about um, just because of manufacturing, where it's being harvested from, that sort of thing. So general rule is if you can find out the secret recipe per one bag or bale, we call sometimes here in Canada, then that would be your go-to. So for example, if you enjoy like ProMix brand, which is very popular here in Canada, um, it's, it's about one cup for the medium size bag. So not the small bag, the small bag is about half a cup. Uh, but for the medium bag that's below a bale, um, that is about one cup of lime, I find, just to bring that pH up. I guess if you've once you've got the pH tester, then you're good to go because you can be adjusting as you go, and uh, <laughs> that that way you're going to get you're going to find find the right level eventually. Uh, but that's good to have a guide. Well, let's talk about humidity here. Tell us what misconceptions people make about humidity. So I always get people saying my plant's not growing or I have yellow leaves or I have crispy leaves and my humidity, my ambient humidity is reading like 60 or 80 some in some cases when it comes to the IKEA cabinet greenhouses. And um, I just can't help but to stress enough that humidity is not the end all be all. And particularly as a soil scientist, humidity and keeping it in balance and not necessarily high is very, very important. So similar to the pH, when we talk about plants only uptake nutrients at specific pHs, because that's when it's bioavailable to the plant, same thing can, kind of goes with humidity as well. 
So if we look at a plant as a straw and the atmosphere around the plant as the stomach of, you know, the whole the whole system, as a plant uptakes water, it actually needs to open up its stomata or its guard cells that guard the stomata to allow CO2 in. And in that whole process, we end up with water leaking out. So we, in some cases, it can be very extreme. Like if you have gutation, for example, you have literal water droplets on your leaves. That's a sign of very high levels of respiration. Or in a majority of cases, we actually can't see it. We can't see that the humidity loss through the leaves. But what ends up happening if we have this really high humidity at 60 or 80% and we have water dripping off the sides of our IKEA cabinets, we have nowhere for that water in the leaf to go. So there's nowhere for the water to exit into. And therefore, the plant, when it opens its stomata to capture CO2, the water actually stays in place. And what ends up happening is that shuts off the tap to the soil solution below that contains all those valuable nutrients that the plant needs. So this is when we end up with lower water uptake. So we can end up with anaerobic bacteria, such as root rot. Root rot is an anaerobic bacteria that happens when we have water sitting too long in our soil systems. And on the extreme side, we end up with nutrient deficiencies. And that is caused by the fact that the nutrients is literally just sitting in the soil solution wanting to be uptaken by the plant, but the plant has nowhere to put it because the plant has nowhere to place that extra water. So you always want the plant on a circular, uh, a circular cycle where it's taking and exiting on a continual basis. And I think the best uh, way to coach plants people, houseplant people on this is to look up VPD, it's vapor pressure deficit, um, and really master kind of the science behind that and understanding um, how that works just a little bit better. And don't, you know, don't put too much energy into it and stress yourself out about it. But just keep in mind that the higher your humidity gets, the higher the ambient temperature needs to be. And if you can't get your ambient temperature high enough to match the humidity levels you're aiming for, then back off on the humidity and um, bring the humidity down to a level that's useful to the temperature that you usually keep your home or your IKEA cabinet or your grow tent or whatever you're growing in and just have those two match because you are going to see less crispy leaves, less yellow leaves, less leaves lost actually just in general if you aim uh, for a balance between humidity and temperature rather than just these really high ends. And if you see water droplets on your walls of your grow tents or in your IKEA cabinets, your humidity is way too high and your plant is not uptaking any sort of nutrients. That is so interesting. And you do see people sometimes posting on Facebook and things with leaves just kind of falling apart in IKEA cabinets, which I presume is down to, you know, the the prevalence, what you've already been talking about, but also the prevalence of maybe lack of air circulation causing issues with um causing issues with um, various diseases that can take hold in those kind of circumstances where humidity is really high? Yeah, so that's a great point. Um, VPD, again, <laughs> actually, if you have the VPD in check and that value in check in your IKEA cabinets, you won't have disease because disease happens when there's an imbalance between the temperature and the humidity. So if your humidity is too high for the temperature of your cabinet, that's when you end up with disease, uh, bacterial and fungal growth and all that sort of stuff. So it all goes back to that. It's kind of, it's crazy, but yeah. yeah. That's really, that's so interesting because I think there is a conception that everything should be just lovely and muggy and uh, humid. But as you say, if everything else isn't quite right, then well, we're all going to look up VPD now and go and go and look. Have you got videos on that on your channel specifically that we can go and watch? 
I do have it on my channel. And then again, that sensor I'm developing oh, is yeah, going okay. to calculate VPD for you. And it's going to tell you on an app. Okay, so my <laughs> listeners have got One some VPD says. homework now. Great. <laughs> yes, yes. I think that there's at least two videos on how to do like how to calculate it by hand. And then I do have the blog post as well that walks you through like how to calculate that too. So fantastic. And then your fourth misconception is uh, was concerning organic fertilizers versus inorganic. I mean, I think we all want to think that organic must be better, but I suspect you're about to tell me that that may not be the case. <laughs> <laughs> not a hundred percent. So I don't actually mind when houseplant people use organic fertilizers. It's when people use organic fertilizers and then they allow their soils to dry out or they sterilize their soil and then use organic fertilizer. So my biggest um, thing when anyone says, oh, I'm using organic fertilizer and I have all these nutrient deficiencies or my plants aren't doing well, I will always ask, how dry do you allow your soil to get? And if you are saying bone dry or to the point that you're not feeling any sort of moisture on your fingertip when you stick your finger into the pot, then I will always try to steer the person into synthetics because they are scared of root rot, which is completely fair. Maybe they're just not as experienced as, you know, a plant parent, which is totally okay. But we end up with nutrient deficiencies if we allow that soil to dry out or if we sterilize it because it goes back to those microbes. If you want to use organic fertilizers, you need the dirtiest soil possible. And uh, that's just kind of where the cutoff happens there. As well, whenever you're using organic fertilizers, if you're not seeing things like mites or uh, in some cases, even fungus nests or, you know, a little bit of mold, the white mold you see on the top of your, your pots, if you're using organic fertilizer and you're not seeing that, that's a bad sign. That means you have a biologically dead soil. So you're not cycling any nutrients whatsoever. I'm thinking of fertilizers that I've seen on the shelves and indeed use. And I can't remember whether all of them say, even tell you whether they're organic or not. I mean, is that something uh, like, is that something that generally oftentimes is left out of the jazzy sales materials, that vital piece of information? They should say organic. If they don't say organic, they will have um, a stamp on it. It'll say OMRI, O-M-R-I. And that's an organic uh, product that doesn't have any synthetics in it. And also with organic fertilizer, you'll tend to find the exception of this is rock phosphate. And the reason for that is because rock phosphate organic and rock phosphate synthetic is the same thing. It's literally a salt rock. Um, but you'll find with organic fertilizers that it's very, very low. Uh, the numbers are very low and the synthetic is very, very high. So if you're seeing double digits, like 20s, 10s, 14s, that sort of thing, you probably have a synthetic. If you're seeing threes, fours, and fives, then it's likely organic. Do we even need to scrape away the white mold or is that like trying to chip away a, an iceberg? Oh, don't even touch it. There's nothing going on there. It's just... Um, it's just hyphae is all it is. It's just mycorrhizal uh, hyphae popping up on the surface of the soil. So if you're using inoculants, like a mycorrhizal uh, inoculant, for example, you will see white mold. That's just a fact. Um, and all it's doing is it's decomposing the organic material in your potting soil. And the reason why houseplant people see this so often, you maybe don't see fuzzy stuff accumulating on our soil out outdoors at the base of a tree is it comes down to the fact that our potting soil is all organic material. There's not a lot of soil in that. It's all technically soil-less. And so because there's a ton of organic material, it does need to be de decomposed and it will be decomposed over time. So if you see it, I, I don't stress out about it. Um, it could be a sign of overwatering, but keep in mind, um, if you have a porous uh, material like a, a porous potting soil you're using things like you said leca or latrice upon and your potting soil mix perlite pumice things like that um, and it's a or it's a chunky mix maybe with uh, orchid bark that sort of thing don't don't stress out and think that it's overwatered. You technically really can't overwater a plant if you have a chunky bark mix and, and that's just a fact because there's so much airflow 
in that system. So you always want to keep it moderately moist, despite the fact that there's fungus. Um, one thing I coach people to do, and uh, most people don't realize is that potting soil in general, regardless of what you're using, will have something called a perched water table in it. So it's essentially just this um, higher density of water in the bottom of our pot. And that's just because that's how water works in a soil profile. And it's based on gravity and capillary action. So bottom waters are very familiar with this as well. And to eliminate that, especially if you know a bulk of your root zone is kind of at the bottom of the pot, which is the case for a lot of uh, plant parents, is just pull your pot out, your nursery pot out, and then give it a tip so that the lip of the pot is the highest point and the bottom of the pot, the bottom corner of the pot is the lowest point. And I have videos on Instagram and, and YouTube showing this and you will notice you get a lot more drainage. And it's actually because you're affecting what we call your water holding capacity or your gravitational uh, pull on the soil system. So you're going to eliminate any excess water that could potentially cause an anaerobic situation. And then you know for sure your plant is okay. But yeah, that's something else to keep in mind there. Yeah, that is a, re a really good one. I was doing that earlier today, having taken some plants out to put them in my trusty washing up bowl to uh, water and uh, I'm doing exactly that. And the only trouble is, is that <laughs> it always it always is the case that I just go too far and end up with soil all over the floor, which is, you know, that's standard really. But um, <laughs> in fact, I've got to go after this, I've got to go back in the house. Thank God we've got hard floors and uh, do some hoovering to clear up the massive amount of mess I've made today with just a small <laughs> amount of repotting. So uh, but that is a really crucial point, that perched water table. Again, more homework for listeners. Go and learn about the perched water table. I'm going to say it one last time. Do check out the show notes for links to Ashley's YouTube channel and other resources on her website, gardeningincanada.net. And Ashley will be joining me again next week for part two. Can't wait. Until then, may your soil be alive with life. Bye. music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops and Overthrown by Josh Woodward. Both tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit the show notes for details.